St. John Bosco's life became largely influenced by the many dreams he had starting in his youth at the age of nine. One might object that we shouldn't predicate our life based on dreams. However, Don Bosco's dreams were not the ordinary kind. They were visions, and he was humble and docile to the direction of the clergy on how to interpret them. It was through the direction of the Catholic Church that we see Don Bosco take the direction divine providence had planned for him. Today we'll hear about the first prophetic dream in this episode of The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima. I'm your host, Matthew Miller. We are now entering a solemn period in Don Bosco's life in which our Lord deigned to reveal his vocation to him. It is God's custom and his great mercy to manifest some signs of the vocation to those men whom he destines for great things, the salvation of souls. So he did with Don Bosco, whom he continued to guide with his almighty hand in every stage of his life and in all his undertakings. It's written in the book of Joel that having succeeded the long barrenness of the synagogue by the fruitfulness of the new church, God will spread his spirit over all men, and your old men will have dreams, and your young men will have visions. Don Bosco had them both. In fact, he recounts his first prophetic dream in his memoirs. At about the age of nine, I had a dream that remained deeply impressed upon me for the rest of my life. In my sleep, it seemed I was close to home, in a very spacious courtyard where a multitude of children gathered. Some were laughing, others joked, and many were swearing. Upon hearing those blasphemies, I immediately sprang into their midst, delivering punches and words to silence them. I invite the listener to remember now that Don Bosco had a fairly strong build for a boy and would have made an excellent scrapper, even at the age of nine. He continues, at that moment, a venerable man appeared of manly age and nobly dressed. A white mantle covered his whole person. His face was so bright that I couldn't even look at it. He called me by name and commanded me to place myself at the head of those children, adding, do not beat them. You must gain their friendship with kindness and charity. Therefore, start immediately teaching them about the horror of sin and the preciousness of virtue. Confused and frightened, I said that I was a poor and ignorant child, unable to speak to those young men about religion. At that moment, all the boys ceased their brawling, cackling, and swearing, and gathered around the man who was speaking. Almost unconsciously, I was saying to myself, Who are you who commands me to do the impossible? You must make the impossible possible by being obedient and acquiring knowledge, said the unusual man. Where and how can I acquire knowledge? I will give you a teacher, under whose direction you can become wise and without whom all wisdom becomes foolishness. But who are you? I am the son of the one whom your mother taught you to greet three times a day. Well, my mother tells me not to talk to strangers without her permission, so tell me your name. Ask my mother. At that moment, I saw beside him a woman of majestic appearance, clothed in a mantle that shone on all sides, as if every point was a bright star. Seeing me grow more and more confused in my questions and answers, he beckoned me to approach her, who graciously took me by the hand. Look, she said to me. As I looked, I noticed that all the other children had run away. In their stead, I saw a multitude of goats, dogs, cats, bears, and several other animals. Here is your field where you must work, the lady continued. Make yourself humble, strong, and sturdy. What you see happening to these animals, you shall do for my children. I then turned my gaze, and behold, instead of fierce animals, there appeared many tame lambs, all leaping and bleating, as if to make merry for that man and lady. At that point, still in my sleep, I began to cry, and I begged that lady to explain because I didn't know what she meant. She placed her hand on my head, saying, In due time, you will understand everything. Then a noise woke me up, and everything disappeared, leaving me very confused and stunned. It seemed that my hands hurt from the punches given, and my face ached from the slaps I received from those miserable brats. 
I was so taken with that man and lady and our mysterious conversation that I couldn't sleep at all the rest of the night. In the morning, I excitedly told the dream to my brothers, who all laughed at me. Then I told my mother and grandmother. Each gave their own interpretation. My brother Joseph said, you'll become the guardian of goats, sheep, and other animals. My mother said, who knows, you may have to become a priest. My brother Anthony said, with his usual dry wit, perhaps you'll become the leader of a band of brigands. But my grandmother, who knew much about the faith but was completely illiterate, gave the final judgment. You mustn't bother with dreams. I was of my grandmother's opinion, but could never get that dream out of my mind. In 1858, I went to Rome to discuss the Salesian congregation with the Pope, and he made me recount all the things that had the slightest appearance of the supernatural in my life. I first told the dream that I had at the age of nine, and he commanded me to write it down in minute detail and leave it to posterity to encourage the sons of the congregation. After this dream, the desire to study and become a priest to benefit the youth increased in Don Bosco, but the family's serious financial difficulties got in the way. Don Bosco's stepbrother, Anthony, also opposed it because he wanted John to become a farmer like himself and help him with the work. He frowned upon his younger brother applying himself to studies. Don Bosco only narrated a minimal part of this dream, which unfolded before his mind over and over again for about 18 years. However, in the last years of his life, he affirmed that although the general picture of this apparition was always the same, it was accompanied by a varied number of secondary scenes that were always new. From these dreams, Don Bosco said that he knew and saw even more clearly not only the foundation of the oratory and the extent of its mission, but also all the obstacles that would arise to impede its progress, all the wars his adversaries would wage against him, and how to win and overcome them. This gave him constant tranquility and assurance of success in his initiatives. But what was Don Bosco's mission? It was the foundation of new religious sodalities, the pious society of St. Francis de Sales, and the institute of the Daughters of Mary Help of Christians, the salvation of young people all over the world through festive oratories, hospices, agricultural and technical schools, and junior seminaries. They were to train good youth for the priesthood worldwide and to provide clergy for needy dioceses through the work of the children of Mary Help of Christians for adult vocations. This was to be accomplished by establishing countless Catholic schools to counter the swarms of impious teachers who were quickly establishing leaders of error and corruption. They propagated good media with numerous printing presses to spread millions of books on piety, history, apologetics, and scholastic volumes, all purged of filthiness. And finally, to shake the lethargy in the Catholic Church with the Salesian Bulletin that reached a monthly circulation of 200,000 copies in various languages, making known the work being done through our Lord and the Blessed Virgin. His mission also included the association of Salesian cooperators with 200,000 members who were to assist him with alms, prayers, and moral support in all his undertakings. They helped establish missions in different parts of the world, America, Asia, and Africa. In doing so, they defended the papacy in various and sometimes glorious circumstances so that it could be said of Don Bosco, I set you over nations and over kingdoms. I have made you a wall of brass to kings and princes, priests and people. St. John Bosco's dreams were a primary source for him to understand what Our Lady wanted from him. He understood this, in part, by the guidance given to him by the Catholic clergy and by analyzing what these dreams represented in light of logic, facts, and his holy faith. His behavior is a model for us today, as we should direct our own lives in accordance with firm reason and faith, and therefore act in a principled way in spite of the apparent obstacles we face. If you'd like to learn about St. John Bosco's writings on Islam, please click on the video above me here. Thank you all so much for watching, and Godspeed.